Opening day is just around the corner, and we're talking all things college baseball with one of the best in the business. You've heard him on ESPN, SEC Network, many other affiliates, our good friend Kyle Peterson. He joins the show once again. Kyle, I always know college baseball season is close when we get you on the airwaves. How you been, my friend? How's it feel knowing opening day just a couple days away? I've been well. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds pretty good. It feels like it's time. I mean, Omaha is home for me, and I just looked at the, the eight-day forecast, and it's supposed to be 60 next week, which doesn't happen here. Where, I mean, usually opening day, there's a foot and a half of snow. So it even feels like it here, which is cool. Mm-hmm. So, KB, let's go ahead and dive right into it. I want to start with this. Obviously, the D1Baseball.com Top 25 comes out. And, of course, you do work with those guys, part owner of D1 Baseball. Uh, But the D1 Baseball Top 25, it's it's always a major talking point, right? Very, very rarely, which basically never, does every fan base agree where they're slotted, what have you. And just this morning, I was actually talking to some LSU buddies, and I want to get your take on this. Because LSU, preseason ranked in the top five, they're sitting at number four. But behind Florida, behind Arkansas, of course, it's the defending national champions. You do lose Paul Skeens and Dylan Cruz, but they are loaded with talent. Tommy White is back. Um, LSU fans feel like maybe they're being a little bit disrespected or slept on going into the 2024 season. Do you buy that at all, that maybe LSU were not giving them enough credit or not valuing them enough as a real contender to go back-to-back? I mean, I feel like, from most people I've seen, admittedly, Arkansas is the pick in the West. And I haven't seen many folks go out on a limb and pick LSU to win back-to-back national champions. Are are we sleeping on LSU fans? Are they being disrespected? Or are they trying to generate some buzz maybe going into opening day? Oh, good Lord. There's nobody <laughs> There's nobody like an LSU fan. I mean, they're fourth in the country, for goodness sakes. Like, if, if disrespecting is putting them forth, then I'd love to live in that world. Um, I mean, listen, there's there's obviously, you know, you lose maybe the most dominant pitcher and that had one of the most dominant seasons in the history of college baseball, and you, know, you lose one of the most dynamic offensive players. So, I, and obviously, there's there's plenty back. Braswell's interesting for me um, because he kind of always felt like that guy that can take a big jump, um, and then you get Mike Bingham from from Arizona that, that I think will really hit. He, he hit what he was at Arizona. But the other thing about LSU that I think gets lost a little bit is if, if Paxton Kling gets 200 at bats this year, I, I think you're going to see a huge jump out of him. He is super talented. Uh, but just kind of injury stuff early, and then there was a bunch of names around him. Back to your original question, no. I, I, I mean, disrespecting someone, if you think they're going to win a national, have a chance to win a national championship, is, you know, if you put them at 20th or something. I mean, they're a top five preseason team. Um, and I, I think the, the biggest question mark is going to be uh, just depth of that pitching staff. Now, that was the biggest question mark last year. You knew what Skeens was going to do. And then the question is, well, what happens next? Um, and Ackenhausen does what, what he does in Omaha. And you know, get a few guys to step up and kind of go through the roof, and they end up winning the whole thing. So, um, no, I don't think they're being disrespected. Uh, I think that the LSU fans are uh, – um, are getting jumpy early this year. That's maybe not a bad thing. <laughs> Kyle, you mentioned Paul Skeens was the most dynamic pitcher in college baseball last year. Dylan Cruz was the most dynamic offensive player. What's really fun about the 2024 season, Kyle, is that the most dynamic pitcher and hitter may be the same guy. That's Jack Caglione over in Gainesville. Just talk about his game a little bit, what you've seen. And I mean, I feel like as good as he was last year, obviously the bat, I think, was ahead of the arm. People forget he was coming off Tommy John surgery. And I mean, you know, registering a 45 ERA or so mid fours in the SEC, it's not like that's a bad season when you look at the offenses and the hitters. But I think he could be even better this year. He's the favorite to win the Golden Spikes Award, which I think is a fitting honor or a fitting preseason tab. Your thoughts on Jack Caglione? Your thoughts on the Florida Gators, who D1 Baseball had at number two in the preseason ranking? Yeah, I mean, he's a freak, man. We're, we're, we're fortunate to have him in, in college baseball. I think he's, he's two totally different players to where um, you know, the swing and miss went down a little bit last year. Obviously, the power is as good as, as anything in the entire country. So the hit tool is not a question. You know he's, you know he's going to hit less than some freaky happens. Um, 
It's just whether or not he can throw strikes on the mound. If he throws strikes on the mound, he matches up with anybody uh, in, in either category. It's the only time he got in trouble last year. I mean, there, rarely are you going to see Caglione go out and give up nine hits in the start. Like, the, the generally, the problems are caused by traffic that he puts on there himself. And, and stuff-wise, he's got a chance to get out of it. But I think there's two things. One, I mean, you've got Kate Fisher who is going to throw you more strikes. And I, I think there's a lot more maybe belief in game management right now. Not stuff, but game management. If Caglione can make that jump, so, I mean, he's not going to go out and walk two guys again. But if he can walk three or four and stay out there for six innings, it totally changes Florida. Um, because if, if he can just avoid, you know, walking three or four guys in innings sometimes, which ended up in a few really short starts and then the bullpen having to go to work early, um, then, I you know, I think you look at Florida in that small group that, that really has a chance to win the whole thing this year. They're exciting, man. I mean, the thing with Cagliano, too, is, you know, last year you had Langford protection or vice versa, depending on where they were, because nobody wants to face either one of them. This year, Colby Shelton kind of becomes that guy. Now, we'll see whether Shelton can stick it short. Um, but offensively, Shelton becomes, and I'm not saying Colby Shelton's going to be what Wyatt Langford was, because Wyatt Langford was one of the two best hitters in the country last year. Um, but it does give Caglio some protection either in front of him or behind him. Which helps, and, and Curlin, who's a sophomore now, but had a massive freshman year power West Florida's going to hit a ton of home runs, whether Caglion goes off like he did last year or not. Um, that, that lineup is loaded. KP, on the note of the Florida Gators and Kevin O'Sullivan specifically, I wanted to get your take on this because actually, yesterday at the time we're speaking, I dropped my SEC baseball head coaching rankings, which, is, as you can imagine, is a really difficult list to put together because there are so many elite coaches in the SEC. But I want to get your take on my top five here because I had Kevin O'Sullivan number one with Jay Johnson at LSU two, Tim Corbin at Mandy three, Dave Van Horn at Arkansas four, and Tony Vitello at Tennessee five. Would you agree, disagree? Where do you have gripe with that top five? And is it fair to list Kevin O'Sullivan as the best in the SEC right now? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's fair. I think it's fair to put Corbs there. I think it's I, I, either one of those. I think if you put them at one, I, I'm not a. I got to look these guys in the eye in a few weeks, so <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go ranking head, head coaches. Um, I will tell you this. And I think anybody would say this. Head coaches get a hell of a lot better if they're good recruiters. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what all those guys have been able to do, is you get the right dudes there now with the portal, build the spots that you need to. But Sully's number since he's been at Florida um, tell a pretty awesome story, and that's why you get a 10-year extension. I mean, the guy's probably never going to coach anywhere else again. And, and I think the one – there's a lot of things that, that jump out of you with Florida, but the consistency is pretty crazy. I mean, the amount of times that he's been to Omaha and the time that he's been in Gainesville is uh, is insane, especially coming out of that league. So I, I, I think that the run he's had, the run Corpus has had, obviously he hasn't been there very long, but he made a pretty pretty good statement year one mm. in Baton Rouge. Um, and Van Hort, <clears throat> especially technically during the game, Dave is so consistent. I mean, the job that they've done in Arkansas, and I know they haven't won the thing, but Manny's been close. I mean, Heller drop fly ball away from doing it. Um, I, we're fortunate to work in this league and be around guys like that because, I mean, you pick any of those and they become, you know, it's not just best coaches in the SEC, it's best coaches in the country. And that's why the league is so consistent every year. KP, you mentioned Dave Van Horn. Let's talk a little Arkansas Razorbacks because they're slotted right there in the D1 Baseball Top 25 between Florida and LSU at number three, Hagen Smith leads the rotation. You know, it really speaks to how good that weekend rotation and that pitching staff is when, you know, you bring in Texas Tech's Friday guy from last year, and he's going to be pitching on Sunday. So it's arguably the best weekend rotation in the country. It might be the best pitching staff in the country. I think they've got enough hitting to get it done. Again, Arkansas is a really sexy pick to win the West. I think they're a really sexy pick to win the national championship. It's just a matter of are the baseball gods finally going to shine on Arkansas? You mentioned that drop pop fly. What do you like about the Hogs this year? And I mean, you know, I don't think it's a matter of me asking you the question, KP, are they talented enough? Are they good enough? I think we'd all agree they are. It's just are things finally going to click and that magical season finally going to happen for Dave Van Horn and Fayetteville? Well, I think they're as complete as anybody. 
when you just look line up defensively, rotation, bullpen, um, you know, obviously the, the portal was pretty good though and filled some spots and, and some guys that, that have really good collegiate stats um, at, at places where you think it's going to transfer. I mean, Hudson White was in Texas Tech, Wells Meyer was in Missouri. I, I, they're going to be facing the same type of stuff that they, obviously Will Star stays in the same league. Um, the Alloy kid is interesting to me because obviously the stats last year were off the charts. And he, he saw plenty of arms on the West Coast, don't get me wrong, but um, I think that's a that's a huge piece for Arkansas. I know they're super excited about him and, and love what they saw in the fall, but I I think Arkansas is is all facets of the game as complete as anybody. And you know, you don't maybe have a Keg Leon or you don't have a Tommy White, but man, you got a lineup to top to bottom that's not a lot of people want to finish. And you roll Hagan Smith out there on Friday night, um, and you, you feel pretty good about yourself. KP, let's talk Tennessee. Their preseason ranked the top 10 of the D1 baseball top 25 ninth. I, I recall just a decade ago or so, which isn't that long, KP, that Tennessee, we used to look at the Vols as that was a sort of layup weekend in conference play, and now we know that's not the case. How <laughs> impressed have you been with the job Tony Vitello has done at Tennessee in such a short amount of time, taking a school where – I mean, I, I, you know, Tennessee's got a solid baseball history, but I wouldn't call them a baseball school. We know football's king there, but, I mean, what he's done in Knoxville in such a short amount of time, how impressive is it to you? I, I mean, I think it's awesome. I mean, the, you know, most of the, the history of Tennessee, yeah, in fact, right. all of the history of Tennessee really – from a huge success standpoint was, was when Delmonica was there. And it's back to the, you know, the Helton days and then the Berkey days. And, and, and then they were kind of gone for almost 20 years. And he flipped it quick. Um, and obviously, like we were talking about the other guys, I mean, he flipped it because he got some twos there. I mean, they, you know, when Notre Dame beat him in the Super a couple of years ago, Tennessee was the best team in the country. Um, and then obviously last year they flipped it, have to go on the road to, to get back. But, I I love what they've done in the portal. Again, Peebles can really hit. We'll see if he can catch, but he can really hit. Uh, Billy Amick, I saw him last year in the regional against NLC, and he's got a chance to, to hit even more home runs, especially in that ballpark. Their offense is probably the best offense in the league, or it's it, it's it's got to be in the discussion. You give the Dryland kid more at bats this year, and I think you're going to see that power number. I wouldn't be surprised if he hits 15 to 20. Um, the question is just going to be, depth of pitching staff. Bean fits obviously is a Friday night guy, but then who fits and what do they look like after that? Um and I think that ends up and I think it's very similar with AM. I mean you, you you look at Tennessee's lineup, AM's lineup, you go, okay, yeah, they're gonna hit. They're absolutely gonna hit. Um are they gonna pitch enough? And I, that's the only question I have of Tennessee right now is just depth of, of the pitching staff, which we're gonna find out the first month. And then obviously you really find out when they get into league play. Mm -hmm. Um but they're they're going to hit, especially in that ballpark. And you know, I think if Burke can cut down the swing and miss a little bit, and he did it pretty good for freshman sophomore year. But Blake Burke only hit 16 home runs last year. If Blake Burke's raw power is not too far behind Keg mm -hmm. I mean, when Burke runs into one, it it goes about as far as any. So you can see a jump, and he still hit 15 or 16 last year. But um, I think you can see even more of a power jump from Blake Burke. I love Tennessee. I love their lineup. Just intrigued to see what they do on the mound. And, KP, you mentioned Texas A&M, and I want to go there next because you're a West Coast guy, as we all know. I recall this time last year we were spending a lot of time talking about the Stanford Cardinal, and they ended up being a pretty good ball club, I would say. But, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. We're in this new world where a guy who's hitting home runs against you in a regional one summer, the next spring can be in your starting lineup and hitting home runs for you. That is the case with Braden Montgomery, the former Stanford Cardinal, now right in the middle of that Texas A&M lineup with Jace Lavalette. It's going to be, again, one of the best in the country. But what do you like about Braden Montgomery specifically? Again, this was arguably the biggest pickup of the portal cycle for Jim Schloss, Nagel, and the Aggies. Yeah, I mean, offensively, athletically, and honestly, he's an awesome kid. Um, but offensively, he's – He's kind of in that freak category when you look at it, athleticism and power. Um, there is some swing and miss, but yeah, the walk numbers are, are up there too. So it, it, it doesn't totally even it out, but turn him out. But I mean, a kid's got big time power, and he's a hell of an athlete. Um, 
we'll see on the pitching side. It's not a stuff related issue. It's just he had a real hard time throwing strikes last year. And there never got to be a part that I think Stanford was. They felt like they had to have guardrails. So when he went in, you got to make sure you got somebody else ready to go. I don't know how much AM is going to use him on the mound, but I know that offensively and honestly defensively, um, he's a huge part of that. I love that offense. Lava Lad is a dude. I mean, he can really play and really run. I mean, hell, I think he stole 15 or 20 bags last year. Um, but I, I, you got to love AM's offense. You know, the issue last year wasn't necessarily stuff on the mound. They just couldn't throw strikes at all. Um, and I think they're comfortable with the stuff that they have this year. It's just whether or not they can throw strikes. Because if they don't throw strikes, you know, it's it's tough to try to win every game 11-10. Uh, if they do throw strikes, A&M is really dangerous. Let's talk Vanderbilt Commodores, KB. Again, when you go look at the top 25, another top 10 team, my question to you is this. Do you believe Vandy can hit enough to complement that fantastic pitching yeah. staff? That's that's my question for them, right? They've got all the arms in the world. You know Corbs is going to stack that pitching staff year after year. I just look up, up and down the lineup, and I wonder, you know, will they be able to complement it? I mean, they're going to play fundamental baseball. They're going to win a lot of games, probably 3-2, to 4-1, to one, just play good, clean Vandy baseball. But – I feel like the hitting is going to be the thing that if they have that piece of it, they got a chance to make a really yeah. deep run. Yeah, I totally agree. And I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it's it's the inverse of what we were just talking about. <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing. If they, I, I'd be shocked if they don't really pitch it. Um, I mean, Holton's been a weekend guy essentially since he showed up on campus. He trails been around. Um, I mean, they're, they're trusted guys within the league. You know what you're going to get. And I think they're comfortable enough with a variety of things they can do in the bullpen. The, the McElbane kid, um, whose brother just left the freshman, I know they're really excited about. But I'm, I'm with you, and I think everybody's the same way. Like, how much are they going to hit? And it doesn't need to be the A&M offense um, because I, I, their, their staff is going to be significantly better. But it's it's got to be more than it was. It's got to be more than it was last year. Um, the Laniv kid has always been intriguing to me because in spurts, he's got a chance to look like a real dude, but he's never he's never been in there consistently enough. Um, you know, last year, I, I, don't, I don't even know if he had 50 at bats, but uh, if he plays every day, Laniv is one guy in that lineup that, that if you watch him at 5 o'clock, you go, man, who is this guy? Um, I mean, it's big-time power. For me, that's that's the main guy in that lineup because you know some of the other guys, you know about what they're going to do. If Lenin can make a jump, if he's playing every day, I think he's got a chance to make a jump. But if he makes a jump, it, it can make a pretty big dent in that Vanderbilt offense. KP, there's three new head coaches mm -hmm. in the SEC. Carrick Jackson at Mizzou, Wes Johnson at Georgia, and Rob Vaughn at Alabama. Uh, just talk about those newcomers a bit. What do you like? I think we obviously realize the challenges that Johnson and Jackson face in Athens and Mizzou. Vaughn taking over a pretty good situation, yep. right? Bama was a fascinating story last year when you think about what happened with their coaching yeah. situation. That team obviously being player-led, going on a run later in the year. But those three new head coaches, three different situations, but what do you like about those three guys? Um. Well, I mean, you know, they've been around in different ways. I mean, obviously, Carrick's background as a head coach and the variety of places he's been, it is without a doubt, not even close, the toughest job in the SEC. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, from a weather standpoint, facilities, history, it's that is a hard. I mean, if, for me, if, if I'm Missouri, if Missouri can get to the regionals once every three years, that's pretty good coming out of that league. And I know that, you know, that's not the goal when you go into a place, but the reality is it's, it's just a tough place to win. It's a really tough place to win. Um, and you got to take advantage of that weather early in the season. I mean, it's it's where nobody wants to go the first few weeks of SEC play. And if they can steal a few early, which I think last last year, the year before, they swept Florida. Last year um, they swept Tennessee. Becomes, yeah, they swept yeah. Tennessee. I think the year before they may have swept Florida. Mm. Um so it's just it's a really hard job, um, you know. For for Robbie, he steps into a situation where you got a team that was kind of the you know the shocker for the the last month of the year. They get to Deuce back. Losing Holman and Shelton is a big deal. I mean, those are two really really good college baseball players. But they got, I mean, they've they've got some pieces that um, that were good last year, and then they they went pretty heavy in the portal with some guys that at least have been in the league. 
So I think that, you know, that, that could be, it could be beneficial. I think of all those that you mentioned, at least this year, Alabama's got the best chance to make some noise. And then I've always been fascinated by West. Um, when Wes was, I remember when Wes was at Mississippi State, so however long ago that was, it's when John Cohn was still the AD. Um, no, Cohn, they're going to head coach. And we were there, and Cohen, in whatever role, he was probably still a head coach then, um, grabbed me and said, hey, you need to go talk to that guy. You need to know him. Because his understanding of track man and pitching and what guys are trying to do is – He's super advanced. And so I, I met, hung out with Wes a little bit then. And then when he was at Arkansas, I called him before an Arkansas series and said, hey, if I come down there early, can I sit in a room with you and you take me through all the track man stuff that, that you look at and how, why it matters and how you try to take that and implement it in the guys that you have. And it was one of the most fascinating hour, hour and a half pitching conversations that I've ever had in my life. Um, and then obviously he goes to the Twins. I think he, he figured out pretty quick, hey, the big league thing is really cool, but at the end of the day, I'm a college guy. And I'm interested to see what it looks like from the head coach's standpoint. He's going to get guys, man, because if, if you get in the room with Wes, you you, you want to be on his side. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't know if it's going to be this year. I don't think it's going to be this year. But I think in a short period of time, you're going to see you're going to see Georgia up in a you know that top half of the SEC as opposed to where they've been. But remember, and obviously. You know, it, it, history can be a little bit strange, but 2000, I mean, the COVID year, so 21, no, 20 and 21, I mean, well, 19, hell, Georgia's one of the top teams in the country. Mm-hmm. I mean, 19, they were they were a top eight national seed, um, and then it was, you know, 11th last year at Florida State, they go in, knock them out, but Georgia was loaded that year, and they were probably the best team in the country in 20. Didn't end up in Omaha. Obviously, 20, there was no season to back end. But you don't have to go too far back to look at Georgia as, as a team that was, that was you know, in that top four to five in the SEC. Haven't been the last few years. I, I think there's a pretty decent chance that West gets them back there. KP, last year was fascinating from the standpoint of you look at who missed the conference tournament. The previous two national champions in Ole Miss – and Mississippi State, both Mike Bianco and Chris Limonis, faced some pressure, I think, especially Limonis, down in Starkville. Again, those are two fan bases that love their college baseball. The expectations are extremely high. Which of those two do you have higher hopes, expectations for? Do you like what they did over the offseason more? And which of those two are you buying more stock in to bounce back this season? Um, I would be surprised if both of them don't bounce, bounce back to some extent. Um, I mean, Ole Miss hits poor really hard offensively. And I know my son's actually a freshman at Ole Miss now. So I was down there when I moved him in and a month or so ago or whatever and went and, and talked to um, – watched some practice for a little bit and talked to, to Mike. And I know that they're they're really excited offensively about, about what they've got coming in. Um, you know, the question is going to, just going to be depth on the mound. And if, if they get depth on the mound, I'd be surprised if, if Ole Miss isn't a team at the end of the year that, you know, is squarely in the regional discussion. And, and who knows? You get a few surprises. They they get a chance to jump back in that hosting side. That, that portal can flip things so fast. Um, but that's really the key for them this year. For State, you know, they get a few guys back that I, I think are a little bit more impactful than Ole Miss gets back offensively. Um, you know, Hines has got a chance. Dakota Jordan is, is, I mean, probably in that raw power category and some of those other guys we talked about. Um, but again, it was last year they couldn't pitch it and they, they couldn't pick it up and throw it the first base. So those are those are the two biggest things for State. And they, they couldn't, you know, that, kind of like AM, they just they didn't throw a ton of strikes and they were also light on stuff. So there's starts and ends on the mound for me. I, I, I think that there's enough offensive for State to be good, but. It's got to be vastly different on the mound and honestly vastly different defensively last year. I and mean, those two things sometimes can go together where, you, you, you know, if you're a solid defensive, to look at Kentucky last year. I mean, Kentucky was one of the best defensive teams in the entire country. And it's amazing how much better that makes your pitch staff look. Because you're not trying to miss every bat. And, and so many times the two things can go together. So they need a jump from a defensive standpoint. They need a jump on the mound. But I, I think their offense is enough to really compete. KP, elite offenses and questions in the pitching staff. It seems like that's a theme in the SEC, and certainly that's the case with the South Carolina Gamecocks as we go to Columbia 
I think you could argue, again, that conversation of best lineups in the SEC. Certainly, South Carolina plays second fiddle to no one with Ethan Petrie and Cole Messina returning. Gavin Casas is back in the lineup. They added some other pieces as well. But the pitching staff, will they get enough, similar to Texas A&M, similar to Tennessee, similar to some others, will they get enough on the mound? What do you like about this South Carolina team? Where do your questions lie? And I mean, I feel like this is a club that if they do get that pitching, if they find those guys to step up, South Carolina could make their first return trip to Omaha in over a decade. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said offensively. They're going to be, I mean, they're going to be, they will match up with anybody else offensively. And, and remember, I mean, they got Parker Nolan that came over from Vanderbilt too, who you know, never had huge home run numbers, but he hit, I think, mean, eight, nine, ten, something like that last year. Um, playing at the ballpark that guys like to hit him for sure, but he's also, you know, he's not going to need to hit third in that lineup. He may hit six. Um, so I think Nolan's got a chance to, to be a real impact transfer guy. But yeah, pitching wise, it's just that's that's where all the question marks are. Um, you need a few guys that, that maybe you weren't counting on or came out of fall and looked a little bit different to jump because similar to the AM discussion that we had a little bit ago, the, the, the question is not going to be off that. The question is going to be how much can they pitch it? And if they can pitch it similar to AM, then I think the offense gives them a chance to, to be a team that's hosting at the back end of the year. If they can't, there's just, you know, you get in that league, and if you, if you don't throw strikes and you can't pitch it, you can't score enough runs. It's just, it's, it's, there's too many arms on the other side. So that, that becomes the biggest thing. Uh, but the beauty of it is, if they figure that out, there's, there's really no concerns about the other side of it. So, I mean, you could either be really close, and I think we're going to know in four weeks, um, or else you could be scrambling just trying to find, you don't need like 11 dudes. I mean, you need like five, six. I mean, give me five or six. Give me a few guys on the weekend that I know could go deep. And then give me three or four guys in the bullpen, ideally, that we can trust in different roles. And that's enough. I mean, yeah, there's a few days you're going to get smoked, so be it. But if you've got that many, because you, you, you get six, seven dudes that you feel like we can go to at any time, then that's, that's plenty with that offer. KP, those six teams, those six SEC teams in the top 10 of the D1 Baseball Top 25, we all know those are contenders for Omaha. Of that next wave of, say, the middle of the pack of the SEC, which it's funny to call these teams middle of the pack because you put them in any other conference and we're talking about them being favorites to win that conference. But of the middle of the pack teams, let's say Bama, South Carolina, Auburn, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Kentucky, who do you like out of that next wave if one or maybe two of those teams were to emerge and surprise and be at the top of the East and the West? Who do you like out of that middle of the pack to emerge and take that next step this season? I don't know that anybody else in the middle of the pack is going to have enough pitching to, to I mean, when you just look at SEC standings, mm. to get up there and potentially win the East or the West. But I do think that, when you look at South Carolina, if they do pitch it enough, it's a team that you're not going to want to see in the postseason. Um, South Carolina is the one for me just because of how deep the offense is. And obviously that can all get erased um, if, if they can't find some stability on the mound. But if they, if they find, you know, something like Vanderbilt, right? I mean, Vanderbilt has to pitch for them to win, for me, when you look at that offense. Um, South Carolina, if they pitch, all right, now we're talking about they absolutely can play with anybody. So of that next group, um, and I'm intrigued to see how consistent Vanderbilt is going to be. That, that's a very different looking offense than the other offenses at the top of the league. But if South Carolina pitches, it, I, I think that's the team that uh, they can make a run and potentially end up here. But it, it's a big if right now. KP, getting off the SEC and going more West Coast. Again, you're a West Coast guy, Stanford alum. Uh, no Stanford in the preseason top 25, but you look at the top 25, the West Coast representation, Oregon State, UC Santa Barbara. We were talking to your good friend Mike Rooney. He loves UC Irvine. Which teams are you most yeah. excited about from the West Coast? that you think could make some noise this year? Because we, you know, admittedly, we spend so much time talking SEC. The SEC runs college baseball, but they put they play some pretty darn good baseball out there in the Pacific Coast as well. Yeah, I, I, Rooms is all over. He, he, he loves Irvine right now. And Irvine got hosed last year. 
I mean, that, that that's a team that should have been in the postseason that wasn't. Um, I don't think they'll have to worry about that this year. Santa Barbara, I mean, if you look at the job that he's done, I mean, he got a bow on, but Santa Barbara's been a really consistent program for the last decade. Um, and I know that they haven't jumped and won the whole thing, but they have got home on. And then obviously Oregon State's Oregon State. I mean, Oregon State's loaded, but it's not a kid that is one of the most electric players in the country. Australian kid that we don't get a chance to see a whole lot across uh, this area because they're never on TV. Um, but ultimately, Oregon State is the best of, of that group for sure. And a team that, that I think you can legitimately say has a chance to win the whole thing. Santa Barbara, Irvine, probably a little bit out of that. We'll see if UCLA can make a jump back into it this year. It's been a while since, well, a while, I mean, maybe four or five years, since UCLA was kind of that UCLA program that we were used to about 10 years ago. I mean, UCLA was on an incredible run. Obviously, we won it one year, but, I mean, they were hosting every single year. Um, and we'll see if it can get back to it. I mean, you know, then everything goes nuts next year. I mean, you got SC, UCLA, Oregon, Washington that go into the Big Ten which totally changes those programs from a baseball standpoint. I think it benefits Big Ten massively, but, you know, I don't think that John Savage was thinking, hey, maybe we'll play a late March series in Happy Valley. And it's, that's not exactly <laughs> when you think when you go to Westwood, um, which still sucks. I, I hate the fact that all that stuff happened because there's so much great history in the pack. But at any rate, um, the one good thing with those teams – going there in Stanford and Calgary on the ACC and obviously the movement to the Big 12, we're going to see the teams on the West Coast just visually a lot more next year than we really have in a while because nobody got the Pac-12 network. And it kind of led to the demise of the conference to some extent. But um, that part would be cool is all this conference realignment stuff is whacked and all over the place. But but the, the reality is, is the West Coast teams actually get a lot more in-season visibility starting next year than they did before. Big Ten Network, ACC Network, and the Big 12, um, just from a, a TV contract standpoint, is so much better on the baseball side. So I guess there's positives to it. But this year, if you got to pick one on the West Coast, I'd go with Oregon State. Now, remember, I mean, Stanford's the only team in the country to go to Omaha the last three years. But they got hammered by the draft. Um, got some cool news today. The, the top Japanese high school power hitter, a kid that everybody's been talking about for a while, just committed to Stanford. So That'll be interesting when they finally get him on campus, which they may be able to do this year. Uh, but regardless, it's it's not quite what it used to be. Style's a little bit different. Some of that's just based on ballparks and weather. Um, but at the end of the year, you're, you're still going to see some West Coast teams that can play. KP, I think you make some really great points, too, because, again, we're sitting here talking college baseball, and for those of us that love it, and we all understand that football is king and those decisions are made for football, but – and it, I, it's you know, based off what you said, it sounds like you're not a huge fan of it, which I, I totally understand. It's like a lot of these decisions weren't made with the other sports in mind. So, like a Southern Cal, right. UCLA, others having to travel to Ames, Iowa, to play a series, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I mean, do you feel like it's going to hurt those schools out west? Like, I mean, how how do those schools adjust to life? Again, football's football, right? They've They've got everything they need. They've got the resources. It's a yeah. lot different of an ask asking these West Coast schools to play Big Ten series, and it just it, it KP. If I'm being honest, it feels wrong. It feels weird. It feels strange. Oh, I, I totally agree, and and I don't think anybody. I mean, you know, you understand it financially because of the football and basketball side, primarily for football. Um, but the reality is, for I mean, there's there's so much. And there is in those other sports, don't get me wrong. But on the baseball side, like every year we would open with Fuller. Fuller and they go come to our place, we'd go to their place, but every year it was the first series. And in those old days, I mean, hell, it was just the six pack. So it was Stanford, Cal, Arizona, Arizona State, SC, and UCLA. And you, it was a home and home with everybody. We played 30 conference games. And it was a battle, man, every single weekend. And that's when West Coast baseball was was probably ahead of the SEC at that point. And the SEC started making their run right about that time. Um, it's just crazy to me to think that Stanford's not going to play UCLA every year. And isn't going to play Arizona State. Isn't going to play Arizona. And I, I do think, I saw John Savage at the ABCA, and, and he was just talking about that conference schedule. And I, I think you'll see a lot of these West Coast teams that were historically in the pack that are going to play each other you know, non-conference, three-game sets, get back to, I know it's not conference, but at least we're playing each other. But still, it, it just doesn't, and from a travel standpoint, it's a joke. I mean, 
you know, to go, go to some of these places are not easy to, to get to. I mean, Stanford and Cal going to Wake or to Boston College or Pitt or wherever else. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, it's flyable, obviously. But I, I do think what you might see, though, is whether it's East Coast or West Coast, some of these teams would go out today to where, you know, Stanford might go play Duke on the weekend, that play East Carolina midweek game, and then play North Carolina the next weekend and go home. Which probably makes some sense from a travel standpoint. Um, you know, but then you're missing seven straight days of class, which isn't exactly what you know, the college experience is supposed to be like. So it's a long-winded answer. I think it sucks, but at the end of the day, there's there's going to be some interesting things to come out of it. And I do really think I think visibility for those teams during the regular season is going to be significantly better than it was before, just because they're going to be on TV more. KP, who's the team that nobody in the college baseball world is talking about right now that you think will surprise and make some serious noise this season? I don't know if nobody's talking about them, but um, I I'll give you two. I love Duke. I mean, Duke was a super regional team last year. Uh, Duke probably, not probably. I mean, Duke has the best bullpen in the entire country. That's kind of what they did it at the end of the year. They pitched a little bit backwards to where um, – figure out what you got on the back end and, and then ultimately fill in from there. They're going to be a little bit transfer heavy offensively. They got some new ones in, but I, I love Duke's pitching staff, um, especially in the back end. And I think it gives them a chance. And I, I'm super intrigued by Iowa, man. I've got Iowa in a few weeks and it is a big league rotation. I mean, if Brody Breck is, is kind of like Caglione. If he throws strikes, he's going to be a top five overall player. And if he throws strikes, I mean, it's, it's as good a slider as I've ever seen in my entire life. And he's going to, I mean, in, I think last week they said he had 102. Um, <laughs> so Iowa stuff-wise, if you go watch their rotation, they can really, really pitch it. Um, not a ton of power last year, but they get a lot of guys back. In fact, most of the guys back. So I, I those are the two for me. Um, and, and we're going to learn a fair amount about Iowa pretty quick. But yeah, last year, I mean, hell, Iowa beat LSU. Um, down at Round Rock, but it's what is it? It's Iowa, Auburn, Virginia, Wichita State, and Jacksonville. I'm actually doing that one. We'll have it on D1 Baseball. Um, I, I think we'll know more about Iowa that weekend, but I, I always got a chance to surprise. Kyle Peterson of ESPN, SEC Network. KP, you mentioned you've got that tournament. Do you have any other series locked in in regards to SEC? I know the TV schedule came out. Uh, any series in particular that you're calling that you're looking forward to, or has that not been finalized yet? No, not yet. Actually, just before we got on this, I was I was talking to Scott Gustis and oversees all that for us. Um, should know in the next few days, but you know, if if history serves itself, which it probably will, we'll <laughs> we'll start banging away probably the second week of March, and then off we go from there. So yeah, well, we're excited on the D1 baseball side. We're going to stream five tournaments, all the different peak events tournaments this year. Um, through the site, which obviously you can then airplay your TV and all that stuff. So we'll get a chance at some pretty, to see some pretty good clubs early, and, and then I'll be on the road once conference season starts. Y'all check him out on D1Baseball.com. You'll hear his voice on ESPN, SEC Network, et cetera. And, of course, when the College World Series rolls around this summer. Kyle Peterson. Kyle, appreciate you taking the time, my friend. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, man, this was fun. I love going through it. Thanks for having me.